All right, that's about to be live, Moish. I'll, I'll admit all. Here you go. We're live, Moishi. Okay, let me just share this on Facebook. Yep. I didn't share it onto Dominion. You can go onto Dominion as well. I'm putting it on Dominion and then we'll start. Yep. No problem. Okay, I don't know, it's not, it's not allowing me to share, but... It should, on Facebook. Yeah, do you want to just share it, Brian? Yep. Okay, fine. Welcome, everyone. Um, it's really exciting to be back at another YJP workshop. Uh, this is going to be our last workshop for the season, um, but we are here. I'm sitting over here with Zaman, we've got Brian, and I want to introduce a legend, um, Alan. I've not known Alan for that long, but I feel like I've known him for a long time. And um, I want to tell you a story how I met Alan. So I've got a dear friend, Leonard Hammersfield, who should be on, and Tommy's watching, maybe he's on social media watching, and he said to me that I've got this guy that, and he, I called him up a few minutes ago and I said, can I share the story? And he said, please do. And he said that Alan literally saved his family's business. Um, all of you would know this extraordinary company called Metallicus, Metallicus Body, which is um, one of the great Australian brands that make everybody look so good. Um, I definitely do not wear it because it doesn't always do the best for my figure, but for many other people, it does great work. And um, Leonard's mom, Melma, she was, you know, literally together with Alan, they were able to save that company and make into the success that it was. So Alan, for the people who don't know, came in from South Africa and didn't come in with much, but made an impact, made a difference, started networking, started getting out there, started changing lives, started changing companies, and has built up an extraordinary company. He now travels around the world lecturing. And um, we were just chatting only a few minutes ago that he lectures in Saudi Arabia and he's made some extraordinary friends there. And we would love to hear, I know this is not your topic, Alan, but later on the end of the evening, we'd love to hear your insight, whether there'll be, maybe perhaps Saudi Arabia will be the next country to sign a peace um, treaty with Israel. That would be interesting. But we'll get to that. We will get to that. But in, in the interim, um, the, the program for tonight is that Alan will give his presentation, which please, don't be shy to get a paper and pen, take notes. There will be a lot of detailed notes passed around after, but um, please let's welcome Alan. Alan, thank you so much for joining. I see Leonard is just joined. So Leonard, I just gave you a whole wrap over there, which you missed. Okay. But, um, you missed my whole intro, Leonard, all about you. But anyway, I'm not gonna repeat it. You can watch it later. But okay. ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together virtually and welcome Alan Mills, the Guru of gurus, cash flow guru, business guru, businessman guru, a man that knows how to save businesses and create businesses and create successes. And tonight, Alan, here's, here's the mission for tonight. Every person over here has, has got a little business they're trying to save to all grow. Tonight, with your help, that's going to happen. Take it away, Alan. So thank you so much, Moishan. As you said, I met you at Leonard Hammersfeld's house a couple of days ago, and wow, you are seriously quick in organizing an event. So I've got 45 minutes to talk, and then we're going to have um, question time, and I'm going to try and cover three hours in 45 minutes. So let me share my screen. And today's topic is about optimizing your financial performance. And I can tell you during COVID, my phone was ringing by the hour from all over the world. And every phone call was about a company who needed to save or improve their financial performance. Now, as a gift 
to the community, the technology platform that I've created, I'm giving for one month at no cost. And I'll send you the notes, Moish. That's the website. You can download my notes at no cost. And all the techniques I'm going to be covering tonight can be implemented. So what are we going to learn? A story of a business is told over four chapters. I look at three cash flow measures every month in a company. I call them the big three cash. Now, every single CEO, everyone on a management team, the objective is to make more cash. And the technique we're going to learn today is called the power of one. How can we apply the power of one to make you more money? The future is obviously more important than the past. I'm going to give you techniques to stress test your future. And one of the outcomes tonight as well is better dealing with your bank, getting a better outcome. Now, one of the great strategy people of our time is a gentleman called Vern Harnish. And Vern wrote a global best-selling book called Rockefeller Habits. Vern made a study of J.D. Rockefeller, who would be today by far the wealthiest person in the world. And Vern's latest book is called Scaling Up. And basically, every successful company needs to master four strategies. People, strategy, execution and cash. So if you want to run a good business, you need to understand the four decisions, people, strategy, execution, and cash. And Vern approached me and I wrote the cash component of the book, Scaling Up. So if you want to read a great book, it's best book in eight countries around the world. It's been voted best business book in eight countries. I'm going to be focusing tonight on cash. But my message is, without people excellence, you will never achieve cash flow excellence. Your business is no different to a sporting match. There's a score. We're going to learn how to, how to actually understand your score and then improve the outcome. So we need to become storytellers. And in terms of people excellence, this is what you need to do in your company. Look at your business and ask yourself core values, low to high. Are your people living your values? And then in terms of performance or productivity, how are your people performing low to high? So what does it mean to have the right people on the bus? An A player is a person who absolutely loves what your company stands for and a person who's achieving their KPIs. A B player is a person who loves what your company stands for, but not as yet productive. And I normally classify B players into B plus or B minus. So B plus with training will get them into an A player. A very dangerous person in a company is a BC player, a person who's performing, but it's all about them. They're not worried about your values. And then a C player is a person not performing and not living your values. So on every single board that I sit on, one of my key measures is to have techniques to convert the Bs and the BCs into A, and exit the C players. I never want to see a C player at the next meeting. So it's absolutely critical that you in your business get the right people on your bus, the A players, the people who are performing, and the people who like what your business stands for. A players want to win the game. We need to teach them how to actually understand the score. So tonight, I've chosen a case study of a company in Melbourne. This company was doing extremely well before COVID. The company is an importer and distributor of hair care products. 
Now, ladies and gents, I'm completely bald. And the reason I chose Mylock is I've never ever used their products. So Mylock is an imported distributor of hair care products, employing 55 people and was doing extremely well until COVID hit us in March 2020. And the founder of the company, George Mylock, stands up and tells us the following. George says, I've had a great year. Revenue is up by 12% from 21.5 to 24 million. And then George says, my operating profit, the KPI of the management team, the profit before interest and tax has improved by 22%. And after interest and tax, George says, we've made one and a half million. So like every CEO I ever meet, this is what George tells the company. Revenues up 12%, operating profit up 22, every single KPI is improving, and George says we've had a brilliant year. Now, every single talk, I start and end the same way. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, Cash is king, and I need to say queen. Cash is king or queen. We need to understand the score. The score of a company is cash. Ladies and gents, for the people who I haven't met, I want you to look at the simple case study and tell me Mylock's cash flow in the current year. Mylock's made 1.5 million profit. If I was sitting on the board of Mylock, one of the first questions I always ask is tell me the cash flow. Revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, cash is king. What is the net cash flow of Mylock? So in the chat box, just enter your number, enter your answer. What do you think Mylock's cash flow is? There's no tricks to this question. What is Mylock's cash flow? We've made one and a half million profit. What do you think their cash flow is? So the first answer I'm getting from Dov is zero. Theo is saying 2.3, oh, I'm assuming million. Ori is saying zero. Let's get one more answer. And Guy Gavani says 300K. So as we can see, I've shown you a simple company and I've had four completely different answers. So let's work out how to do it. Now, one of the smartest CEOs I've worked with in the world is the ex-CEO of one of the big banks in Asia, OCBC Bank. It's a Chinese bank in Singapore. And Alan Pathmaraja, an Indian gentleman, ran this bank. And he 10 x the bank over a number of years. And when I said to him, Alan, you knew nothing about banking. What made you such a great leader? And he said to me, how do you spell leader? He said, the first thing I always do as a leader is I L, I listen. And he said, do you realize listen and silent have the same letters. When I listen, I'm silent. And he said, when I listen, I listen with empathy. I always take off my shoes and I put on the shoes of the people I talk to. I'm an accountant. If I'm going to talk to you non-financial people in accounting terminology, I'm going to, I'm going to lose you. I've got to listen to you and all the techniques today are going to be listening with empathy. Just to finish, listen. As a leader, he always had a positive attitude. D, he was never scared to make tough decisions. E, he knew how to energize the company. And R was resilience. Every company is like a coil. It's not how far you drop. It's how quick you rise. Cash flow definition number one. If you start the year 
with $10,000 in the bank and you end the year and you've only got $1,000 left in your bank account, every one of you will tell me your cash flow is negative 9,000. Cash flow definition number one. It's called net cash flow. All I look at, and I get this report weekly or monthly on all the boards. I ask them to give me the change in all the bank accounts. Please give me the change in all the bank accounts. So if I look at my lock, bank account number one, cash at bank, there's been no movement. Short-term debt has had a reduction. We've reduced our debt from 3.1 to 2.8 million. That's excellent, positive 300. And my long-term debt has had no change. So if I was looking at my lock, it would take me 10 seconds to calculate the cash. All I look at is the movement in the bank accounts and then I say, my lock, your net cash flow, the movement in all your bank accounts is positive 300,000. And Vern Harnish, in all his talks, he says the traits of a good CEO are the ability to predict, ability to delegate, and then repeat, repeat, repeat. Get your message down clearly on a piece of paper and repeat, repeat, repeat until people mock you. I'm going to try and do that tonight. So the first thing we've learned is cash flow is very easy to calculate. It's the movement in your bank accounts. So if we're looking at Mylock and Mylock says business is great, I then say to Mylock, do you realize you've only made 300,000 cash? There's a 1.2 million gap between profit and cash. Let's explain it to the people because A players want to know the score and they want to make you more of it. Now, when you produce a set of accounts, we produce a profit and loss and a balance sheet. All of us love to discuss the profit and loss. It's so easy to understand. Revenue, margins, profit. I can explain that to any non-financial person but the balance sheet is equally important. You will never become a storyteller unless you can understand the balance sheet. However, the accounting profession has made the balance sheet complex. We need to make it simple. We can explain a balance sheet in one sentence. Funding equals operations. That's what a balance sheet looked like. Funding is either through debt or equity. You fund your business either by you or the bank. So if I look at Mylock's company, our equity is 4 million. And how much debt does Mylock have? 1 million long term, 2.8 million short term, that's 3.8 million less the 100,000 cash in the bank. Mylock's got debt of 3.7 million. Mylock has therefore got 7.7 .7 million invested in the company. It's no different to buying a property for 7.7 .7 million. You put a deposit of four and you borrow 3.7. Now remember what the game is. The game is to make more cash. Within operations, Within a balance sheet, there are really only three items a management team controls. Your management team are responsible for three items. Accounts receivable, how quickly people pay you. Your inventory, or in a service company, we call that work in progress. The work you've done that hasn't as yet been invoiced, less your suppliers, your payables. So the management team are responsible for collections, inventory management, or invoicing the work as frequently as, as frequently as we can, and how we negotiate terms with the suppliers. These three items 
are called working capital. Working capital are the collections, inventory, whip, or payables. So in Mylock's company, we've got 5 million receivables. We've got 3.2 million in inventory, and our suppliers are giving us three and a half million of, a, of assistance. Our working capital is 4.7 million. So of the 7.7 .7 million, 4.7 million is working capital. The balance sheet has to add up to 7.7. .7. Everything else that's not your working capital are the myriads of terms that frighten the non-financial people. Terms like accruals, prepayments, provisions, deferred tax, everything that's not these three items, I just call other, other capital. In Mylock's case, it's $3 million. And in Mylock's case, it's one item, a $3 million investment in a warehouse. So let's repeat, repeat, repeat. I started today and I said to you, never before have numbers mean more important to business. My other message during COVID is don't waste a great crisis. Don't waste a great crisis. Understand your numbers. Revenue is vanity. Profit is sanity. Cash is king. I then said to you there are three cash flow measures. Cash flow measurement number one, it's the CEO measure. What is the change in all your bank accounts? In other words, at the beginning of the period, just please, there are a few people who have got their volume on. Can you just go to mute? Okay, so at the beginning of the period, we need to understand your opening bank accounts. At the closing, we need to know your closing bank accounts. The movement is your net cash flow. Mylox made 300,000. I then said to you, your profit and balance sheet are equally important. If you want to improve your business, you need to become a storyteller. In one sentence, we can explain the balance sheet. Funding, which is either debt or equity. Funding equals operations. Operations consist of two components, working capital, receivables, inventory, or work in progress minus your payables. And the rest of the balance sheet are called other capital. So in other words, if I was sitting with George Mylock and the team on the 31st of December, this is what I would explain to them. Ladies and gents, we've got 4 million of our money in the business. The bank's got 3.7. Where did we spend our money? We've got 4.7 million invested in working capital. Three items, receivables, inventory minus payables. And then we got 3 million invested in a warehouse. And ladies and gents, we want to play this game better, the game of business. The game of business is about making more cash. You, the management team, are not responsible for that part of the business. The result is cash. So how do we make more cash? Well, the first thing you need to understand is the movement in equity is your profit. So Mylock started the year with two and a half million. He made a one and a half million profit. He ends with four million of equity. Mylock started the year with four million of debt. He ends with 3.7 million. He generated 300,000 in cash. So let's explain that again. What happened in Mylock's company? Mylock made a profit of one and a half million. Mylock generated $300,000 
which we've reduced our debt. So in other words, from a funding perspective, you made 1.5 million profit and you reduced your debt by repaying the $300,000 of cash that you made. So we owe the bank less money. The funding in the company has increased by 1.2 million. Remember the game, how we're playing the game. The game is to make more cash. I want to make more than 300,000. How do I make it? I need to become an expert in profit. So every single month in every business I ever work with, we have a discussion around price, around our volumes, around our margins, and every item of overheads. Where can we better manage it? And then how can we do it? How can we better manage or reduce our working capital? What can we do to collect faster? When we make a sale, how do we educate the customer about our rules? What can we do to better manage our inventory? Or if I'm in a service company, can I invoice the work in advance? Can I invoice more frequently? And then what can I do to renegotiate terms with my suppliers? So in other words, the game is to grow your profit, shrink your working capital, and optimize your cash. So in Mylock's business, just to go through the numbers very quickly, where did Mylock spend the money? Remember, he made 1.5 million profit. He repaid the bank 300. Where did Mylock spend the 1.2 million? So let me just reconcile it very quickly for you. Funding equals operation. Debt plus equity is working capital plus other capital. That's grown by 1.2 million. Working capital. Receivables is up by a million dollars. Inventory is up by 700,000. And payables is up by 500. Your working capital, Mylock, has increased by 1.2 million. So in other words, Mylock made 1.5 million profit, repaid the bank to 300,000, and he spent the money increasing the working capital by 1.2 million because other capital has had no change. That's what happened in Mylock's business. And as I said, repeat, 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 but I'm going quickly tonight. You can replay the video or I'll show you where you can access a more detailed recording as well. Remember what the game is. We want to make more money. A story of numbers is told over four chapters. Every single company I ever walk into, like the George Mylock, they tell you how well they've done. Revenues up by 12% by and operating profits up 22 and we made 1.5 million profit, they tell you. And then I say to them, the quick way to calculate cash, the result of your business is the change in all your bank accounts. And that's 300,000. You will never understand your cash by looking at your profit. However, if you look at the four chapters, chapter one is profit. You made 1.5 million. You then spent 1.2 million growing your working capital. You spent nothing in other. Can you see why you generated 300,000? So on the boards that I sit on, the non-financial people sitting around the table, we need to take away terminology they won't understand. We need to listen with empathy. So on one page, I can summarize their business. And I say, you made a one and a half million profit, well done. But you then spent 1.2 million growing your working capital, your three items, receivables, your inventory, less your payables. You spent nothing in chapter three other you therefore generated 300,000 cash. How do you make more cash? 
your management team are responsible for your profit and your working capital management. Your management team are responsible for the following levers. Profit is all about your pricing, your volumes, your margins, and your overheads. And then your management team also needs to understand very clearly how quickly people pay you, the amount of inventory we hold, or how efficiently we invoice the work we do, and do we have the right terms with our suppliers? Management team, do you realize if working capital only grew by 900,000, we would have made 600,000 cash? It's a logical story. The analogy is your business is no different to a murder mystery. <clears throat> Imagine reading chapter one of a murder mystery you will never know who committed the crime. Every business I'm walking into is reading their chapter one over and over again, and they don't know the score. What I'm saying to business, if you employ the right people, the A players, the people who want to win the game, we need to explain to them very clearly how to play the game. And it's about profitability, and working capital optimization. That's what it is. It's about how do you manage your profit and your working capital as efficiently as possible. So if I was looking at Mylock's business, George says we had a great year. And I say, yes, you did, George. Your profit was great. But your chapter two is bad, your working capital. Nothing happened in other. You haven't made enough money. Only one of your four chapters is performing. How can you think you've had a good year? Cash flow is the result. It's told over four chapters. And the message that I'm also giving to companies is as follows. Cash flow is the result. It's chapter four. When business grow, they need money. When business decline, there's cash flow impacts. But if we don't teach the management team how to play the game, they can be making decisions that create wastage. We need to teach your management team that every time they make a decision, what can they do better to create gains for you? And as I said to you, price, volume, margins, overheads, receivables, inventory, payables, put your prices up good for cash. Collect slower, bad for cash. We need to show our team every month how have they performed. So, for example, in Mylox company, revenues up by 12%, excellent. Margins are up by 0.75, very good. Why did you grow the overheads by 15% when revenue only grew by, by 12? Why are we collecting eight days slower? Inventory is up by 11 days and good for cash, we're paying suppliers a bit slower. And if I'm sophisticated enough, I can convert these into dollars and I can show the management team the quality of how they've run the business. So in Mylock's case, there's been more wastage than gains. The management team has cost us 780,000 in Mylock's company. So what's the most simple way to implement this? I could sit down with any business in this room and I could tell you, or I could ask you, what does success look like? What is your profile? What should your profile look like? And Mylock says to us, if I make 40% margin and 12% profit, I'm happy. If I collect in 60 days, that's good. 50 days of inventory, and I want to pay my suppliers in 60 days. And then I say to the company, cash flow is the result of growth and management. Your management team either does a good job, an average job, or a bad job. A green, a yellow, or a red. So for example, in Mylock's case, 
greater than 40% margin is a green, 37 to 40 yellow, less than 37 red. Make more than 12% profit, excellent. 10 to 12 average, less than 10 bad. Collect quicker than 60 days, excellent. 60 to 70 yellow, greater than 70 red. And every month I would show Mylox company this. I would say, do you realize why we haven't made enough money? Cash flow is the result of the way we manage our profit and our working capital. We're running our profit in color code yellow and our working capital in color code red. We got to teach the company to move in that direction. Every time you move in this direction, you make more money. Every time you go in that direction, money leaves your business. Now, for those of you who have been to London, every time you get on a train, they say to you, mind the gap when you arrive at the station. My message for business in Australia is mind the gap. Cash flow is the result of growth and management. My lock, you've got a two and a half percent gap in your margins and profit. You've got 16 days gap in receivables, 28 days gap in inventory. Cash flow is the result of growth and management. Now, for the next five minutes, I'm going to give you a technique. So if you said to me, give me one idea that will impact me for the rest of my life financially, it's this. There are only seven things a company can do to make more profit, more cash, and grow their value. There are four profit, and there are three working capital levers you can adjust. Price, volume, cost of goods, or your margins, your overheads, receivables, inventory, and payable days. Sitting on the desk of every person in a management team is the power of one. And this is what my technology will, will basically produce for you. Enter your financials and we'll produce your power of one. What do the 1% or one day changes do in a company? So in my locks case, put your prices up by 1%, cash improves by 190,000, and profit improves by 240,000. Mylock, sell 1% more. You'll make 43,000 cash, 90,000 profit. In Mylock's company, price is five times more sensitive than volume to cash. How can a salesperson go on the road without knowing this relationship? Price is basically three times the sensitivity of volume to profit. Mylock's got two and a half problems in margin. Every 1% is 147,000. Mylock's collecting 16 days too slowly. One day is worth 65,000. Basically in Mylock's company, over a million dollars is sitting in other people's bank accounts that belong in ours. If all George Mylock does is change 1%, the cash will improve by 594. And remember, cash at the moment is 300. We will triple our cash flow by making a 1% change. Are you telling me every single person today couldn't change a 1% in their business? The impacts are dramatic. Every quarter on every board that I sit on, I run a power of one workshop. We actually go through the levers and then we work out which ones we can change, which are the little changes we can make. So in Mylock's company, we change two levers. This is how I run the workshop. I put seven levers down the side of a whiteboard. I give everyone in the room these little sticky notes and then lever by lever, we workshop. Which products or which services can we put our prices up? 
where can we change our volumes? And when we finished each lever, we come back to the board and we rank them from most to least sensitive. And then we'll choose the top one, two, or three ideas that we implement for the quarter. Some ideas might be linked, but what you want to do is entrench in the brains of every person who works for you. Your power of one is your DNA. Challenge your power of one every single quarter. Every time you make a decision, your brain should be ticking over and saying, where can I change these various levers? What can I do better? These little 1% changes is that will give you the company you've always dreamt of. The power of one can be drilled down to a more micro basis. One of the businesses that I'm involved in, we own medical centers. We own 30 medical centers in skin cancer around Australia. And we pay our doctors 50%. This particular medical center, we pay our doctors, the doctors earn on average $250 an hour. The doctor gets 125, we get 125. So we've created the key measure called the power of an hour. The doctors think we make a fortune. Then we show the doctor out of every hour that we, if we basically get 125, staff wages are running at $67 an hour, property expenses 22, medical consumables nine, do you realize, doctor, we're losing $11.50 if you only build $250? You make $125, we lose $11. We need to get at least $350 to make this medical center viable. Then we create KPIs in, a, in the medical center that basically run our practice. So these are the five things that we measure in our skin cancer clinics. These are traffic lights that sit in the, basically in the tea room that every nurse, every doctor sees every day. KPI number one, we call net promoter score. It's a measurement of customer satisfaction. Our target is 85. This week, we are on 86 in this clinic. Empty appointments. So we've got a whole back office that makes appointments for the doctors. If we get more than 29 empty appointment slots for the next three weeks, we're running in red. So this week we got 77 empty slots. Our rule is every patient who leaves, we need to get on average 80% rebooking. This week we're running at 96. We want to have 95% of the doctor's time utilized. We had 81. And our target is 370 an hour. We're actually getting 480. And obviously, the key thing is to save lives. So we're measuring all the time the non-melanomas and the melanomas that we identify. So the power of one can be drilled down to a more micro example. This is another company I'm on the board of who's in the men's footwear trade. The owner of the company said to me, I own 120 stores. Every person thinks we're making a fortune of money. They all know our margin. And I said to the owner, how many pairs of shoes do you sell a year? He said, 800,000. I said, what was your profit last year? He said, 800,000. I said, that's interesting. Call in the designers the marketing people, the operational people, and the retail heads. And I'm going to show them the power of a shoe. We sell a pair of shoes on average for $175. We make a 61% margin. Occupancy costs run at 23%, $40 a pair. Staff retail wages, 16%, $29. Admin on costs. Our total costs are 105. We make $1 a pair. All the staff ever knew was that number. I said to them, I'm coming back in two weeks.
come up with a plan to make $5 a pair. So obviously, we've got hundreds of different styles. Why should the average price be $175? Make it $177.50. We challenged our margin. How can we source better? Get a, a 50 cent better performance from our sourcing. And then we challenged every one of these inputs. Six months later, we were up to $5 a pair. We had gamified the business. We had a team of A players who knew our score. So let's go back to the beginning. I started today and I said to you, never before have numbers been more important. You might be marketing people or operational people. However, the score is told and needs to be understood by everyone. And as I said to you, your, your business is like a murder mystery. It's a four chapter story. It's a chapter told about the profit, about the working capital, three items, receivables, inventory, payables. The rest of the balance sheet we just called other. The result of your business is your cash flow. The quick way to calculate cash flow is change in all the bank accounts. How do we fix the cash? The only seven things we can do. Price, volume, margins, and overheads. Collections, inventory, and payables sitting on the desk of every single person on a management team should be the power of one. What do the 1% or one day changes do to profit and cash? Every three months, run a power of one workshop with your team and ask yourself what or how many 1% changes can we make? I started today and I said revenue is vanity, Profit is sanity, cash is king. I'm going to end the same way and I'm going to stop sharing and now open up for questions. Thank you. You know, Alan, thank you so much. When uh, we've done so many workshops and we, we build this one a masterclass, and honestly, what a masterclass. Um, you know, we've all lost our sanity many times in business and um, thinking that we're doing so well and you've really taught us, you know, what a cash flow is and how critical and how valuable understanding that cash flow is. And um, we all agree that there's so much more that we need to learn. Um, I'm sitting over here with Zama. We've just got a few questions and I'll just say to the crowd out there also, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and um, Zama and I will read them out. But um, I, one of the questions I really want to ask you is, um, I know it's not so much in terms of what you were talking about, but you mentioned with that book that you help co-host in terms of the, the cash flow. You mentioned that one of the most critical things is people. And how do you nurture people? How do you bring out the best in people and maintain them and allow them to grow and evolve within the business, um, you know, and yet ultimately wanting to have that, that cash flow positive for yourself, if you like? So firstly, I'm going to answer your question by saying what, what you're running here today, Moish, is unbelievable. The fact that we're educating the community is the first step. It's training. And again, all the boards that I'm sitting on, firstly, every person who works in the company knows how we've rated them. Are they an A player? Are they a B player? Or they're a C player or a B, C? And then we've sat down with them and we've mapped out the changes they need to make to be to migrate to an A. So you've got to create job scorecards for your people. A job scorecard is not a job description. It's a scorecard that people know what success looks like. So you are rating your people against your values. And again, I'm saying to every person in this room here today, Make sure your company has got clearly defined values because that's what you stand for as a person. These are the values 
you hire on values and you fire on values. So you've got to make sure that your values are clearly defined and the values need to be unique. And then the next thing you need to do is to make sure people know what success looks like, looks like in their job. So every single person's got a clear plan to migrate. Robert, thank you. Um, how do you best communicate your values to both your teams and to your customers? Firstly, your values should be visible all over your company. So I'm going to, I'll share a, a board that I work with. I work in a community in Melbourne or in Australia that you probably never heard of called the Brethren Community. Have you ever heard of the Brethren Community? They're a very religious Christian community. They only go to their own schools and not allowed to go to university. They don't marry anyone else. And they're some of the best business people I've ever met. Sounds like the Jewish community. Similar to the Jewish community, very similar. But I'm going to show you a company who's in an industry that you would say is totally price driven. They provide cladding. So cladding is what you put on a building. You would say it's a price-driven trade. Am I right? You're a subcontractor putting cladding. So this company is called Alclad. And I'll share my screen and I'll show you their values. Just give me a second. So the first value that we've got, we employ a lot of Vietnamese people. And when we were interviewing the staff, that one of the Vietnamese people couldn't say the word R. So one of our values is everything we do has to be very good for the customer. And remember, these are all over the building on their website. So these are just different graphics for very good for the customer. The next value they've got is the AT. When we go to a building site, everyone has got a T-shirt on that says the AT. Every trade laughs at us. Who are these guys, the arrogant guys wearing the A-team T-shirt? Well, we behave like the A-team. We put up more square meters on a building than any other cladder in Australia. So we are the A-team because of our performance. The next value that we've got in this company it's called every day is a fryer. On Friday, they have a barbecue. It's a happy day. If anyone walks into their building, their staff, and they've got a miserable face, everyone says every day is a fryer. Yeah, it's a happy place to work. And the last value that we've got in this company is when you walk into their factory, there's a big sign which reads making swarf. Swarf is aluminium shavings coming off steel, aluminium. It's like sawdust. So my answer is create values that are unique to your business and bring them to life. Everyone who works for you should know what the values are. Amazing, thank you, Alan. Just quite a few people, if someone wants to go out and start their own business, what would be the three critical things that you would advise them? Okay, so you mentioned Leonard gave a beautiful, you gave a beautiful story about Leonard. Story number one, when I met um, Leonard's beautiful mom, Melma, she was selling accessories. And Leonard will tell you she wasn't making a lot of money. She had a lot of staff and she was selling hats, gloves, everything. It was a, a warehouse full of products. And I walked into Melma's business and I said, put all your products on a table and rank them from where you see the most opportunity. And I said, which product here do you believe is going to win? And Melma took the body stocking, the Metallica's stretch fabric product. And she said, that's my winner. I put every other product on the ground and I said to Melma, the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. And that's my message to everyone. Everyone thinks the grass is greener, but keep the main thing, the main thing. And that's when you'll do well. So focus on excellence. 
The other area I said to you, make sure you get the right people on the bus because wherever you want to go, the right people will take you there. Get A players and then teach them how to win this game. And then repeat, repeat, repeat. You guys are building a sand pit. Throw in a few rocks. Don't throw in sand because you're never going to finish the job. Every single quarter, identify the one, two, or three things that you need to do to achieve success. You talk a lot about running a business, but what about doing business? And where do you draw the line of what's more important and when do you go from doing business to running one? So doing business to running one, again, doing business, make sure resonating through your head, your business model makes sense. So make sure when you, when you, if you run a business, you want to make sure that you're producing the right amount of revenue, the right amount of margin, the profit, and you're running your working capital, you're producing cash, and you're reinvesting back in the business. So make sure from what I've said to you today, so let's focus on that. Make sure the power of one is working in your business. What I say to every business is price is a gift that never stops giving. You put your prices up. Not only does it fix your profit and cash, but it puts the valuation of your company on steroids. Alan, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, we had Gabby Leibovich, the founder of Catch of the Day. And one of the things that he said, which was quite inspiring, was that from day one, he had to be, you know, cash positive and he had to be profitable. And someone over here asked a question to everyone. So many businesses today um, have enormous, enormous evaluations, but are totally losing so much money on a daily basis. What are your thoughts on that? Well, again, the way these uh, new age businesses are being valued is on blue sky. So people are, are looking at the future and these businesses will eventually come right. My focus and I've got a technology company, so a lot of what my valuation is, is also on blue sky. But for the most, the 95% of traditional business, you can survive with good people. You can survive with good strategy, with good execution, but you run out of cash and it's game over. So my answer is yes. If you can raise an unlimited number of cash, it's great. But you run out of cash and the game's over. It's finished. So protect your cash and understand it. How do you go ahead and um, the best way to nurture and lead people when you're also running a business and doing business? Well, as a CEO, your, your role is to basically coach your people. You want to build the people up. So make sure you're spending a lot of time. And my message to every leader is read. I can tell you the best leaders in the world are reading nonstop. Get audible books if you don't like reading and set a goal. So uh, books like Scaling Up, books like Good to Great. Leonard put some good books as, he, as his suggestion. The more you learn, the better you'll become as a leader. Learn from the best. Attend these seminars. If you pick up one idea, but well, let me let me we've got we just got time for a couple more questions. <laughs> uh, first of all, what's your opinion about um, cash flow transactional, you know, um, finance businesses, and it's especially the best one in Australia, one of the best, uh, Button, which is with Rail Ross. Do you know him? And what he wants a shout out for his company. How, do you know that company and how no, good? I don't it? actually. Well, he's clearly not doing a good enough job of marketing, so we are marketing it for him tonight, and. Um, Everyone can get to know, but it's a lot of wonderful businesses. But on a serious note, leading into that, how do you get the maximum out of your bank? You know, you spoke about getting the best out of your providers, and essentially a bank is a provider. We speak Spanish. The bank speaks Portuguese. That's the easiest way. Every business is talking about profit, and your bank is talking about capacity to repay. So we talk about profitability. And the bank says, do you have enough cash to repay us? If you want to understand your bank, become a four-chapter storyteller. 
Because if you understand your profit, your working capital, your chapter three other, you therefore understand your cash. If you understand your cash, you understand your bank. And my other message to companies, remember cash flow is the movement in the bank accounts. The bank knows your cash every day of your lives. If the bank's worried about you, you should be worried about you. Love it. Alan, we, we like to start on time and end on time. And on behalf of YGP, really, um, I just want to thank you so much for agreeing to do this talk. We met at Leonard's dining room table. Um, and thank you, Leonard, for the kind introduction. And literally, you were so gracious and you said yes right away. And then a week and a half later, here we are, you're live and, and you know, giving a masterclass, really. To everyone out there, thank you for joining in on YGP. Thank you to Brian Berger for doing all the work behind the scene. We love you, Brian. Incredible mm -hmm. job. Um, thank you to Zaman and Hood on our team. Um, I just want to say we're having another workshop. Um, it's different, but on Thursday night, we've got a Shabbat dinner coming up on um, next weekend. We've got a Hanukkah party. There'll be menorahs given out. There's nonstop events at YGP. Get involved, get inspired, get engaged, because this is a place to be. Um, and we love having you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you again, Alan. Thank you to all of you. And have a great evening or great night. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.